Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Who here wants a stroke? <laughs> then you're at the wrong talk. No. Can people read this all the way back there? Then you don't need a neurologist. So, I mean, this is, this is pretty small, so I'm hoping you guys can see this. And it's not fair to preface my talk with a talk about chocolates coming up. That's, uh, that's a lot to uh, live up to. Oh, they, they want me in the spotlight, so it's uh, more of a torture effect. So here we go. Much better. Um, <laughs> uh, so just, just for, uh, first off, um, does anyone know what a vascular neurologist is? Anybody? Good start. Keep going. Anyone want to build on that? Yes, I, I do do that. Th the reason I ask this question is because no one knows what I do. Hospitals don't know what I do. <laughs> Most neurologists don't know what I do. So <laughs> it's simple as, in terms of its title, vascular neurologist. It would be nice, okay, do it with vascular and a neurologist. Well, it's kind of nice. The problem is, is why I really like to do these talks is what do I do? Why do people need me? There are lots of people who do vascular, and there's lots of neurologists around. So who needs something that combines two titles? So you have this big name. Well, the thing is, stroke is very complex. And they want me to com condense it down into 20 minutes. Well, in fact, I'll condense it even, even further than that because it's very simple with regards to the concept. It's very complex in terms of the diagnosis and treatment. And so from my standpoint, I'm just going to relay some topics. And then we're going to open up the discussion. In fact, I'm going to have a discussion right off the bat because I want to make sure you guys are engaged because I can't see any one of you with this light in my face. <laughs> so I need to hear you since I can't see you. All right. So first off is the concept of TIA. This is, this is a term that's used a lot, uh, a lot from people. Yeah, I had a TIA. My hand was over here. I had a TIA. I had a TIA. So what is a TIA? Very good. Transient ischemic attack. All right. And I have little handouts for people who actually can answer these questions. <laughs> All right. Transient ischemic attack. So it's brief, it's stroke like, and it's attack. Something they try to make, you know, when they say MI, myocardial infarction, heart attack, they try to make it really kind of a cool lingo so people can think about it a little bit. Well, the thing about it is it's, it's, it's a stroke like, it's not a stroke. It, it only lasts minutes. I'm talking about minutes. If anything lasts longer than minutes, you likely damaged your brain. And that's the important aspect here is people will sit at home, they go, you know what, I can't use my hand, but I'm sure it'll go away. 30 minutes, an hour, two hours later, you've likely had a stroke. Your likelihood of having a bigger stroke where you end up in a nursing home is probably about 25% within the next week or so. You need to be seen immediately. TIA is not something to be trifled with. It's an emergency. You need to be seen. And people say, well, you know what, my hand was just numb, or I just had a facial droop, or I couldn't talk for a couple seconds. I don't want to go to the emergency room and, and spend six hours sitting in the emergency room waiting for it. Well, guess what? I'm going to give you a secret code today, since you came just for me. When you say TIA or stroke in the emergency room, you get to the front of the line. <laughs> okay. Another question I get is, you know, sh should I drive myself in? So should I drive myself in, or should I go by an ambulance? Which is faster? So, so let me, give, let me even, even, even preface this with, you live across the street <laughs> from the hospital. You can see, see I'm setting you up here. You live across the street from the hospital, and you have a TA or a stroke. Should you walk across the street? Should you drive across the street? Or should you call 911? Call 911. Absolutely. The reason is not just because you'll get there faster. You also get to the front of the line. You get in the back door, which is actually the front of the line. Also, they're going to give you treatment from your house to the emergency room. So it's so much better to actually call 911. You are going to get treatment. You're going to get to the front of the line. Now, what are the most common symptoms? Anybody know? Speech. speech is one of them. Got another one? Paralysis, weakness. Well, I hope no one has a TR stroke in this room. They, I hope they can recognize it because this. <laughs> Right, so here's, here's, the, here, here's the perfect example is that we're trying to go, I'm on the Department of Health, the stroke work group with regards to developing a stroke program for the entire state of Washington. And part of it is recognizing stroke. So we use this, this, uh, this uh, mnemonic FAST, uh, F-A-S-T. So face, arm, speech, and time. 
And so with regards to face, is your face symmetric, is your tongue symmetric? Uh, and your arm, can you lift your arm up, is one weak? Can you speech, is it garbled, can you not speak? And then how much time is it going on? This is something that's really kind of uh, utilized even throughout the emer emergency personnel. Even the EMTs coming to your house to evaluate you will use the fast mnemonic to evaluate you. And so it's actually a very good thing to, to evaluate in terms of face. But all the, all the symptoms, weakness, numbness, speech changes, visual changes, you can have trouble balancing, and then dizziness. Is dizziness a stroke? I mean, you just feel kind of, oh, I'm kind of dizzy. Is that a stroke? Maybe. Maybe. Everybody knows about these carotid arteries that are floating in the head, right? Well, there's something called vertebral arteries, which are two arteries in the back of the head, which are actually more important. They keep you alive. They can cause dizziness if they're blocked. And that may be the only symptoms you're experiencing. And that's why people can miss some of these. <coughs> so here's an example of this. I'll try to be the three-handed monster up here and uh, point out some things here. So basically what we have is that kind of nose, the chin. So this is the big carotid artery coming up here. And then you have these vertebral arteries. Even, even this evaluation through in a stroke book actually forgets to even put in the vertebral arteries. So you can understand that stroke is very underutilized, under, uh, less understood than it really should, even in the expert community. Now, what's here on the, on the right here? What, what is that? Can people, people know what that is? <coughs> this is actually a bleed in the head. And so this is to give you an example of the difference between what strokes are. People hear stroke, and they go, okay, what's a stroke? Blocked artery. Well, it's not just a blocked artery. Stroke can actually be classified as something that breaks open the artery. So it's not just one of these blocked arteries that's a stroke, it's what's called an ischemic stroke, but you can have a, what's called a hemorrhagic stroke. So something to be. So here's just an example, just kind of get people understood. So these, these are worms in your head, not actually worms. That would be gross. But these are arteries that actually can be superimposed onto this image. So you can actually see how the arteries actually flow up around the brain. So these are actually your arteries in your head. Everybody has these. And I brought my little portable ultrasound to prove it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So here's just an example of kind of a discussion point with regards to the kinds of stroke. Here's another hemorrhagic stroke. This is where you can have the bleed in the head. And here's an actual clot. So here's the artery, this little gray thing. And this little thing about the size of my pinky is sitting in this person's artery. That's pretty scary, isn't it? The size of my pinky in someone's artery. Now, if anybody has a pin, click the pin, the top of the pin. That size is enough to cause a major devastating stroke in your brain. Now, take something the size of my pinky, and you tell me what that's going to cause. This is a 52-year-old woman with a clot the size of my pinky in her carotid artery. Very dangerous. Strokes can happen at any age, in utero, all the way. I have a patient who's 8. I have a patient who's 104, and everything in between. The average person I take care of is between 48 and 52 with regards to strokes. Now, that's not the average age for the community, but that's the average age I get because of, of my specialty. Now, what, what can we do about stroke? A person comes in, and they have these symptoms, the weakness, the numbness, the speech changes, all this kind of stuff. What do we want to do? MRI. MRI. Good, good start. The problem with MRI is it takes about an hour to get all done. You want to do a clot buster. Exactly. And we'll talk about the qualifications for clot buster in a second. Now, if a person comes in with weakness or numbness or speech changes, do we just give them this drug? It could kill you. That's part of the assessment when a person comes in. They come in, they're having a stroke, and I walk into the room, I say, you have a stroke, we have five minutes to make the decision, this drug could kill you, do you want it? Probably want to give them a little more information because now you just scared the pants off them and their whole family. So <laughs> CT is much faster. You can do it in, in seconds, you can get further information, and you want to make sure it's, some, it's actually a stroke. Right. You don't want to give this medication, it's called TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. It told me not to do any scientific words, but I'm going to throw that one out there. This drug can bust up a clot. But guess what the consequences of busting up a clot is? Bleeding. <laughs> and unclot everything in your whole body. You can have abdominal hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage. Well, here's a CT showing all these modalities of stroke. This is a, what's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You don't, want to give it, you don't want to give a clot buster in someone who's already bleeding. Here's one where you have an old stroke, huge stroke. If you give it there, they're probably going to bleed. You don't want to give the, the blood, clot busting medication to someone who's already bleeding again inside the head. This is called a subdural hematoma. 
This is a kind of a cool thing. I'll discuss that in a second. And this is a glioblastoma. The only actual one you would actually give TPA to is this one right here where you see this little clot in the brain. And so you want to do some stratification before you start giving people this, this medication. Subdural hematoma, actually classified as a stroke, but it's outside the brain. And what's the, what's the factor of this? What's the importance of this with regards to a person's, person's outcome? Squishing the brain. You bleed until you squish the brain. Now, anybody heard second hit syndrome? What's second hit syndrome? I think it's like when the brain sloshes back into the um, tissue, so it's not the actual blow, but it's the hit. Close. You're on the right track. The, the thing about second hit syndrome is a person goes and gets smacked in the head. It's not just young kids. Second hit syndrome is described in teenagers that go out in the field, get hit, get a little concussion, come back on the field, get hit again, and die. Well, it's not just kids, it's anybody, and it's not just severe hits, it's even bumps on the head on the door. And what I'm talking about is the brain isn't just sloshing around in this fluid up in the brain. It's actually connected by these tiny little veins to the skull. It's actually tethered. And as you get older, your brain shrinks. Okay? And this little thing that's now tethered kind of like this gets really taut. Now strengthen that string really tight and then bust it, and it'll break. That's what happens. People get these little breaks in these tiny little veins from that initial hit and they can form what's called subdural hematomas. And when you break those tiny little veins, they breed really, really slowly. And you go to the ER, I hit my head, I'm fine. Two days later, you're not waking up or you're talking funny because you got blood in your head. It's because you have this delayed blood in your head. So when people hit their head, it's not benign, especially as you get older. You say, yeah, I played football in high school, I played football when I was in college, I took so many hits, and all I did was bump my head on the door. Well, that's enough now because your brain is no longer the size of your brain cavity, it's now the size of a walnut. Well, not maybe that small, but. <laughs> All right, enough of that. I won't insult anybody more. All right, what contributes to a stroke? Diet. Diet, blood pressure. Stress actually is related to the blood pressure because you actually release some adrenaline when you're stressed, which can raise your blood pressure, and people who are susceptible can have a stroke. Absolutely. Anything else? Hereditary genetics, absolutely. Not just platelet count, but anything that causes clottings, like genetic hypercoagulability syndrome and autonomic, uh, 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 autoimmune syndromes like lupus, things like that. All right, no one mentioned the most common one. Um, <laughs> I'm a little nervous about you guys. Uh, smoking. <laughs> smoking is, is a major one. And why is smoking? I mean, we, we get on our high horses, right? You come in the office and you're smoking, I go, stop smoking. Well, there's more to it than that. Why would I say stop smoking? What's the importance of smoking? Why care? What does smoking do? Well, it damages blood vessel lining, right? Because all the toxins in there. It also causes carbon monoxide poisoning, which is not necessarily good for anybody. It's like living in space. I'm not sure how many people can actually live in space without a helmet, but that's basically what you're doing when you're smoking. Cholesterol can, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity. What two of these are not directly linked to stroke? They're indirectly linked to stroke. Anybody? Obesity is not directly linked, correct. This guy's smart. I'm going to have him give my talk here. So it's indirectly linked. So obesity tends to have some lifestyle associations, lack of exercise, things of that nature, but it's not directly linked. It's indirectly linked. And then you got one of these last four, right? So that's kind of an easy one. But which one of these last four are not directly linked to stroke? They don't cause stroke. They don't cause the damage to cause stroke. What, what, which one of those? High blood, pressure. High blood pressure can damage blood vessels directly by tearing the artery, by making them narrow. Diabetes is a toxin. The high blood sugar gets inside the cell, damages it, forms calcified plaque, which break off and form clots. Diabetes is absolutely a direct cause. Cholesterol. Well, everybody hears about cholesterol, right? We all, I mean, it's in the water, isn't it? Isn't Lipitor in the water? I mean, <laughs> I don't have any race stripes on my back, so uh, I'm not a NASCAR driver for the pharmaceutical companies, so in case someone wants to snipe me off out there who works for the South pharmaceutical companies. Cholesterol. You could have a 700 cholesterol and not have a stroke or a heart attack, and why is that? Because the analogy I use is that you have a wall, and you punch a hole in the wall. Now you want to plaster it up. So you want to, you want to put some plaster on it. The body uses cholesterol and some calcium to, to plaster up the wall. The thing is, pretend you don't sand the wall. OK? 
Okay. So, so when you damage your arterial wall, either from diabetes, smoking, or high blood pressure, the cholesterol comes and helps form a little, little shielding on it. But it's not very good. It's like gritty sand. So you can imagine if you come and have a high blood pressure episode, you break off all the sand and shower it to the brain. But the thing is, if you don't have damaged blood vessels, you don't form a plaque. You don't form a clot. So as long as you don't have the damage, it doesn't matter what your cholesterol is. And I'm going to get killed on this when people watch this later, but that's okay because this is true. But I guess I guarantee the pharmaceutical companies want you to think that this is the way to go. You have to have this. If your cholesterol is 201 and it should be 200, you have to be on a statin. That's not true. Okay. I have a little thing. I'm, I'm, def, uh, I'm so glad this is being taped so I can be held accountable later. Um, <laughs> My wife is a dietitian. She's very good at what she does. She did, had a master's degree in lipid management, and we have a clinic, and I brought some of her stuff in there. A lot of it is about anti-inflammatory diet. A lot of it is about creating an atmosphere within your body that last, allows it to heal itself, because you can form a lining over that little sanded plaque within your arteries if you do it right. The thing is, here's, here's the fun part, is that statins, the medication they use to lower your cholesterol, actually were created from some plants, something called red yeast rice. Anybody heard of that? They brought in red yeast rice. I wanted to prescribe this to my patients. All of a sudden, I'm not allowed to prescribe this to my patients anymore. Does anyone know why? It's not approved by FDA, but there's more to it than that. The pharmaceutical companies approached the FDA and the government and said, we have people having side effects when they take statins and the red yeast rice. So we want to ban red yeast rice so we can give people statins. Is that a conspiracy or not? I have a lot more conspiracy <laughs> theories if you'd like to hear them. All right. Formation of clots. People have heard about the irregular heart rhythm, atrial fibrillation, cancer, genetics. All this can cause clots. Then there's these less known. Hole in the heart called Peyton foramen ovale, estrogen. Like I said, I have women who in their 30s are having strokes. And you go looking for a cause and it's not there. Why is it? We're thinking it has something to do with the lining of the blood vessels and its interactions with hormones and inflammatory markers. Very important. And then homocysteine is a, is a marker that can be elevated too, usually with, uh, with uh, uh, inflammation and B vitamin metabolism. Now here's just a graphic designation just to scare people to death. So here's the <laughs> here's a brain on the left. Here's a brain on the right. The one on the left looks like a walnut. The one on the right looks pretty good. And it's associated with bad habits and good habits. This gives you an example. This is actually what a brain looks like when it succumbs to a lot of damage. Doesn't get enough blood flow. Doesn't give enough nutrients, right? This is what happens. It shrinks. And it shrinks faster than if you take care of yourself. Just a quick graphic representation. Now, I have a couple uh, examples of questions. And I figured I'll just bring them up. But there's a couple other things I want to I want to bring up. So. I've been, whatever you've been doing, right, name a bad habit, I won't ask questions, I know you know them, for years. Nothing has ever happened, I'm fine, no big deal. And even if it does, I will just flat out just keel over and die on the floor of a stroke. Is that true? Can a stroke kill you? Yeah. Not really. It's usually the other stuff. You have a stroke, you rarely die from it. You usually die from pneumonia or bleeding or bowel problems or skin infections, other clots or heart attacks months after the event in a miserable, awful death. Have I kind of brought your appetite up to speed here? <laughs> it's true. You don't really die from a stroke. So the best way to, to, to stop a stroke is to prevent the stroke. You don't want a stroke. You're not going to die from a stroke. You're going to die from something else. It's really miserable. So I always tell these people who say, you know what, I'm just going to die anyway. Well, do you want to you die at the age of 135, you know, doing you know, skydiving and run into bus and, or a heart attack and drop dead? Or do you want to die miserably over months with one of these diseases? So my, my feeling is take care of yourself, and everything else will take care of itself. And here's another thing. I have an acquaintance, a friend, an uncle, a hamster, who smoked all their life. They're 120 years old, and they're fine. I'm going to be fine just like them. Well, why did they get the attention? Why are they known throughout the family or make it on the Today Show? It's because this is so rare. They have a genetic fortitude that they were made of concrete. Okay, We're not made of concrete. 99.99% of us are not. So all the people that actually did all this stuff did not live to 120 years old, and we know that. So that's not a good argument either. What other arguments can we have? All right, I exercise and take my medications. So what if I smoke or eat fatty foods or do all this other stuff? Or you take your aspirin, right? 
So if you take your aspirin, you can smoke. Is that true? You can say yes. It's just, I'm, not, I'm not setting you up. Yes, I am. Um, so with regards to what you do for your life, if you do bad things that cause stroke, no matter what medications you take, you will have a stroke or a heart attack. These little things, this is an analogy, kind of a leak in a retention wall. So you have a wall holding back sludge, hopefully not in Hungary. It's nasty. Um, with regards to the hole in the, in, the, in the wall. So you want to go plug up the hole in the wall. Okay? That plug that you're using in your finger is your aspirin, your blood pressure medication, all these other things. But guess what's down the road? A bulldozer knocking over the wall, right, because of your smoking, your habits, and all the other things you're not doing for yourself. So you can plug up all these tiny leaks, but the big things you've got to take care of first, other than these little things don't, don't do anything at all. And that's my main point. All right. Can herbal medications reduce my risk of stroke? Yes? No? Absolutely. The thing is, is that people usually look into herbal medications, usually look into their health in the first place. So it's an indirect method of way of you're looking into your health in the first place. So yes, indirectly it can. The problem we have with this is that be careful with herbal supplementation because if you're on Coumadin for blood clotting or atrial fibrillation, you can actually harm your way of metabolizing the Coumadin itself and actually either cause bleeding or cause clots. So you want to be very careful the medications you're taking because some of them can actually interact. So that's one thing you want to be careful of. And then I don't like doctors, and if I don't see them, I won't even have anything bad to me. Well, I don't like doctors either, and I'm such glad this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> that's not true. You know that's not a, a valid argument, right? We all want to be you know, diagnosed early, excuse me, because there are so many things we can actually do about this stuff. And so you, you want to get diagnosed early. You just want to find a doctor that listens to you. And I hear about this a lot. I'm sure there's going to be questions out there. Say, what if my doctor doesn't listen? What if my doctor just tells me this? What if my doctor just gives me medication and tells me to take it? My answer to that, find a new doctor. If you don't have a doctor, you walk in and won't answer all your questions, you don't have the right doctor. And so my feeling is this is an educational point, is that you are out for your own health. The insurance companies are out for your health. You know that. It's been a big discussion about that recently. You're out for your own health. Preventative health is not covered, maybe in 2014 in a different realm. But my feeling is you have to take care of yourself. If you feel like you want to take care of yourself, you ask the questions you want to ask. And if you've felt like you're, by your health practitioners that you're belittled in some way or not getting the answers, find a new health practitioner. This is your health. And then what tests can I expect to, you know, if I want to prevent stroke? And this is just a picture of stuff like MRI, CAT scan, echo, and then a smiling little girl up here. Of course, you know when you see a smiling little girl, it can't possibly be a, you know, a dangerous test or painful. Uh, it's not. Um, and then what if I have already had a stroke? What do I do to prevent another one? The same thing you did to prevent the first one, right? Eat right, don't smoke, take care of your blood sugars, all that stuff. However, the risk will always be greater than the first one, right? So if you have a first one, your likelihood of having a second one is much greater at that point. You need to, you need to have an assessment and surveillance ongoing. And then how can I get better from my stroke? Practice. Whatever doesn't work, practice it. One point, important point. People who have strokes, when they get stressed, they have an infection, um, they don't get good sleep, it actually looks like they can have another stroke. And that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make, is that it looks like you're having a new stroke, but in fact, they're not. And the reason is because the damaged area, all the little surrounding cells can actually take over for the damaged tissue and actually function on a pretty high level. But after you get stressed for a while or sleep or have an infection, it actually doesn't work anymore, and it looks like they're having another stroke. And then what's new in stroke care? Well, early intervention, right? We had talked about the clot buster. We can actually take the clots out. And we talked about the call 911, absolutely correct, before you go there. And the best chance of doing something is early. We talk about taking the clot out at three hours, four and a half hours, six hours, longer. No matter how many hours that you've noticed the symptoms or you're found, you bring the person in immediately. The faster we find them and treat them, the better they're going to have. And then should I take an aspirin for stroke, like in a heart attack? Is that a guess or is that an absolute? Well, you know, aspirin can help with bleeding, so if you're in a bleeding state, you're going to bleed. Absolutely. Correct. Absolutely correct. Not if it's a bleed. So you're not necessarily treating it the same way. You want to make sure you get assessed fast. And that's the point, is that with a, with a heart attack, you take the aspirin. You've already started treatment. 
with a stroke, you better call someone because we have to make sure it's not a bleed before we give you treatment. And then here's some cool little things, like a little corkscrew, right? Who's drinking wine in here? <laughs> Just pump it right out of there. So a little corkscrew, kind of take the clot out. You have these little filaments that come in and take the clot out. Some kind of cool little things. And here's another thing. This is something I'm involved in. We're actually doing uh, stroke assessments across the state and also across state lines. I actually do this in Montana. I take care of stroke patients in Oregon. I run a stroke center uh, in uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, and I take stroke call actually up here in some of the metropolitan area. And what we use is this real-time audio video. This is so much faster to take care of stroke. It allows me to immediately dial in within 30 seconds of being paged, assess the patient, get the CT, give them this clot-busting medication within 15 minutes. The fastest I've ever been able to do it, where I have to get up, get dressed, get in the car, go to the ER, talk to the patient, is 52 minutes. So in fact, people say, well, maybe you're just being lazy. Maybe. No. Actually, it's much faster. It's, this is actually a better care model with regards to the assessment of stroke patient and treatments of stroke patient. And I'll allow all the questions I in a second. So here's me in my office treating a patient. Here's our CT. I can bring it up, show you guys, everything like that. And then where should you go if you have a stroke? Simple answer, nearest ER. But the problem is, is that outcome has been linked to the level of services. So we're talking about stroke centers. Right here, everybody's stroke center. We're a stroke center this, stroke center that. It does help. It helps to be stroke certified. But not all stroke centers are created equally. Okay? So you've got to think about who is going to treat you when you get to the stroke center. You call it a stroke center. Why is it called a stroke center? Because they have pathways. They have order sets. But that's it. Expertise is not part of the requirements to become a JCO certified stroke center. You don't even have to have a neurologist to be a stroke certified. So you have these levels of care. So you got to think about where you're going to end up, who's going to see you, who's going to assess you before you, they go on to give you a uh, stroke. So here's another thing is that we hear about this evidence-based medicine. What's evidence-based? Anybody can quote me some evidence-based medicine. There's articles from the uh, Phillips that says they don't. You breathe, you live, you eat, you live, you eventually die. That's our evidence-based medicine right there. That's what we have. Everything else can be refuted in some way. We hear about this evidence-based medicine. What is that? That means 3% more of 47,000 people got a statistically significant more benefit from this particular drug than the other 45,000 in the other group. So, what, 3% of 47,000 is not very many. But it's statistically significant. That's evidence-based. So we're talking about when do you fall within this evidence-based? Where do we get our evidence-based medicine from right now? Anybody know? The pharmaceutical companies. You tell me there's not some bias there. Not only that, the vast majority of negative studies are not published. So how do we know what doesn't work? We may know what kind of works, but we don't know what doesn't work. So here we are, some possibly biased entities, creating an entity where we're actually getting our evidence to practice by influencing you on TV, influencing us in our office. But in fact, is it truly medicine? We don't know. And not only that, the, the stratification of people within those studies, the inclusion exclusion criteria, like over 75 on Tuesday on a full moon, doesn't own a frog, right? You don't fall within that, oh well, what do we do? Well, sometimes you have to use your brain. And so that's where it comes down to is the vast majority of people actually don't fall within these nice little criteria that we base our evidence-based medicine. So you better have the experience to be able to determine what's good and what's bad because you're likely not going to fall within that little realm. And so this is just kind of my, my little description that you're not a cookie and I don't practice cookie-cutter medicine. I do practice evidence-based medicine, but I also don't treat people all the same because I want to treat each person differently because their presentation is ev always different, always. And now for a scary example. Want to know a scary example? Now, they want to cut me off. I haven't heard any waves or anything, but do people, people want to stop and get a break and things like that and ask questions, or would you like me to go on? Go on. All right. Thank you. Because you guys are missing Monday Night Football for this. <laughs> All right. All right. So here's a person on the left. Here's a person on the right. This person came in with dizziness. This person came in with dizziness. This person's alive, and this person's dead. You can see his ventricles are huge, and the brain just doesn't look right. It should look nice and fluffy like that. This is the same person. They came in alive, and now they're dead. They came in with dizziness. So 
well, why would a person who comes with dizziness look like this on one hand and then look like this by the next morning? We weren't called on this patient. I was called on this patient. Brain dead, dead. So here's what I'm trying to ex make an example is we don't take things for granted. Sometimes there are subtle findings that you need to look for. And I try to get this related to people. Is I want to make sure that when you go in for a problem or you have a loved one with a problem, ask for someone who knows what they're doing. You think that's simple, but it's not. There's a lot of politics in medicine. And just because you go to a hospital that touts great care doesn't mean you're going to get the right expert. You're going to get the people that they hired or coerced to work for that hospital. Boy, I'm so glad I'm being taped right now. <laughs> All right, you can tell I'm an independent physician probably forever now. Um, all right, so that's what I'm saying. And then going back through the records, there were some subtle findings. We weren't called. So my, my feeling is don't take anything for granted because we're not statistics, we're individuals. So just because statistically a person with dizziness isn't going to have a stroke doesn't mean that you should be treated in that box. Everybody should take for face value that something more serious could happen and then go from there. Want one more scary example? Yes, ma'am. I'm also interested. What was going on with that individual's brain that caused the stroke? Right. So what happened here is that there's a there's a big artery that goes to the back of the brain called the basal artery, and it keeps us alive. It also involves the way we our eyes move, our feelings of perception, our balance, all those kinds of things. And oftentimes, when those arteries are blocked, you actually just get dizziness, or a little bit of eye flutter, or double vision. And in fact, you go back to the records; they were complaining of double vision. So this is what I'm saying, is that making sure that when you go to a place that, that takes care of each individual entity, make sure that they're going through all the risk factors and stratification, and the expert is called to discuss that. Sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes retrospectively, and people who are clinicians often have the advantage of knowing the symptoms to look. So it's not the radiologist's fault for necessarily missing something, because sometimes they don't get any information. They're just like, a person's dizzy. I mean, they, they, but we as clinicians come in and say, oh, there's dizzy, oh, there's a little double vision. I know exactly where I'm looking, and I can kind of window things around and, and look for that. So, all right, one more scary example. So here's a 42-year-old woman, came to the emergency room. This is the person I took care of. She was driving down the street right across from the hospital. She was actually bringing her teenage son to the hospital to be seen in a clinic, when all of a sudden she limped over, ran into a telephone pole, Telephone pole fell in the car. The EMTs grabbed her, took her to the, to the emergency room. She was speaking kind of funny. She wasn't moving everything correctly. Uh, and in fact, her right side wasn't moving, and she was so slurred she couldn't understand. But then new history is actually she doesn't speak English. And guess what? The, the person who speaks English, her son, is actually giving a report to the emergency personnel out by the telephone pole sitting on the car. So she came in, some weakness, severe dysarthria, excuse me, it was left side weakness, and confusion. So we couldn't get really get a history, right? So a person comes in with this kind of thing, we're worried about a stroke, right? I mean, this is, this is, they call. So they called me, I come down, I start giving a history, start doing all this kind of stuff, look at the CT scan, which is the only thing you're, you're supposed to do when you're giving for JACO certified stroke centers is CT scan, make sure there's nothing going on. Okay, well, no big changes on that CT scan, so what are we gonna do? Does she qualify for the clot buster? She's within three hours. She's got focal weakness, right? She fits, right? Current evidence-based medicine and protocols give TPA, right? Perfect. We're done. That's not scary, is it? No. Let me give you the scary part. All right. The scary part is, is there a clot? When I'm assessing a person with a stroke, I want to make sure there's a clot to bust. I'm going to give them a potentially dangerous medication that could cause them to bleed. I want to make sure there's a clot. So we usually do a, a study that actually looks at the blood vessels, right? So let's do a, st a study that looks at the blood vessels. What if it isn't a stroke, right? This isn't her brain, by the way. This is her uterus, which is what they did. Instead of doing this angiogram of the brain, they did it of her uterus because they thought it was a big aneurysm in her gut. And just to kind of clue you in, we can't do more than one angiogram on a person at a time because the dye is going to ruin their kidney. So now I can't look at the clot? Oh, great. Now what do I do, right? Do I just kind of use my superpowers or my Star Trek tricorder and look inside the brain? Well, kind of. I use what's called a transcranial Doppler, which is a cool little ultrasound. A lot of hospitals have it. Not every hospital has it. And so we actually did that. And we found that th there was a lot of, lot of high-velocity blood flow going through part of her brain. So could it be a clot? Maybe. 
But the problem is, based on, based on my training, this number here was way too high. So here I am in the emergency room. I'm saying, you know what? This is looking kind of fishy. She fits within the criteria. I don't want to give her a clot about medication. So should I be calling my lawyer, you know, not giving her <laughs> medication? So everybody's like, okay, give her TPA. And I'm like, no. So here are ER physicians, right? All these doctors tell me, give TPA. I say, no, I'm not going to give TPA. And guess what? I'm going to get sued if she has a clot. But something's fishy here. I want to know what's going on. So we did an angiogram. But further, just to like kind of give you history, is that finally the actual sister of the patient came in. And she goes, oh, by the way, she had this really 10 out of 10 severe headache three days earlier, and she went to bed, and she only got up to go take her son to the doctor. Does anyone know what that means, the most severe headache of your life? Subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm rupture. Do you want to give TPA to an aneurysm rupture? Probably not. And so most of the stroke centers in this country would have given TPA. And guess what? If they would have bled and died, they would have chalked it up to the 6% of people that usually have uh, symptomatic hemorrhages and just put it as that. My feeling is you have to have a little more stratification before you give people severe uh, and dangerous medications. And so this is just a cool little picture of the aneurysm right here. Big aneurysm with a blocked artery called vasospasm. All right, so why are these examples important? So just basically to, to reinforce, you're not a statistic. Go to a place that you're going to get individualized, specialized care by what the hospital promises you. And then all stroke centers aren't created equally. And then all these little things just to show that I'm pretty cool at what I do. But I don't. <laughs> and there's my number, which you can get anytime. And then my mantra is better to predict and prevent than to react. I can react really well. I mean, everybody knows me. I can react really well. But I like to prevent and I like to predict. And so that's my expertise. And so here's my, who's trained me right here. And she's showing me how to read an image right here. So is ocular my, are ocular migraines associated with stroke? And I was being smarmy with my answer. Well, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more. <laughs> There's an association when people talk about ocular migraines. What is that? So ocular means eye, and the migraines are a kind of headache. And in fact, migraines aren't headaches. Uh, you can actually have a migraine and have no headache whatsoever. And so that's kind of what she's getting at is that people have these visual symptoms, blurry vision, spots, twinkles, whatever, and then don't have a headache with or without headache. And is that associated with a stroke? There's literature showing that those people who have those symptoms do have a higher risk of stroke. They do MRIs or they follow them up longitudinally and they end up with strokes in their brain. And why is that? Is it because the migraine causes the stroke or do they have symptoms that look like migraine they are actually a uh, pre-stroke symptom? And from my experience, people who have uh, visual symptoms and headaches or without headaches but end up with a stroke often had the syndrome beforehand. It wasn't the migraine that caused a stroke. It's just that was part of the, syn that was part of the symptom of the syndrome they had. So it, it's, a little, it's a little complex, but what I'm talking about is there's other, other diseases. So m my analogy is when you hit yourself in the head, I don't do this on a regular basis, with a hammer, with a brick, with a rock, with a chair, you get a headache. But the causes were caused by multiple different things. So just because you have a headache doesn't mean it's a headache. It could be something else. And I think I handed out one thing about headaches because it's very important. It's not just because I'm trying to sell my services on headache. It's this headache is very important in the evaluation of stroke because I have several people who come in for evaluation of headache and they turn out to have aneurysm, a dissection of their artery, autoimmune disease, something of that nature that actually could lead to a stroke if we don't take care of it. And the only manifestation they had was a headache or a single neurological event, numbness, tingling, vision changes. So long answer for good question. So you definitely, hello, hello. You've definitely sold me that I need to take care of myself in terms of knowing what I'm doing and that I need to choose um, the, the best hospital to go to and the best people to see there. But I don't know how to make that choice. So after I call 911 and a random ambulance comes, I say, take me to Aaron. I want to go down to Redmond. <laughs> I mean, I live in Woodenville.